Check Podcasts. Hi, I'm Bruce Williams. I'm the CEO of the Greater Victoria Chamber of Commerce. Welcome to Chamber Chats, which as always we are recording here in the podcasting studio of Czech Television, one of our chamber champions. I would like to begin, as always, by acknowledging that I live and work in the unceded ancestral territory of the Lekwungen speaking nations, known by us as the Songhees and the Esquimalt. Chamber Chats is made possible by the support of Island Savings, a division of First West Credit Union, and by C SPAN Victoria Shipyards. So when you're checking on your health, they check your vital signs to see how you're doing, your blood pressure and your heart rate and that sort of thing. The same thing happens for our community and has been happening for 17 years when the Victoria Foundation releases their annual vital signs report. That came out recently and joining me today to talk about that is Jonathan Dick, who is the Director of Communications and Community Engagement with the Victoria Foundation. Jonathan, you're no stranger to check either because you guys have a program here all the time. That's correct. Yeah, we, uh, we're we very proud of working with Czech in a number of ways, including on our Vital Victoria podcast with Lucky Bud. So uh, uh, so when you subscribe to this one, I encourage you to subscribe to ours as well. So. Right on. Good call. Okay. So we had a launch for this uh, Vital Signs Report this year. I was pleased to be on a panel with former Victoria Mayor Alan Lowe and uh, my friend and colleague Emily de Rosenroll, the CEO of the South Island Prosperity Partnership. And we, we sort of led a bit of a conversation and had some comments from the room. But overall, This, of course, is graded. It's like getting a report card. And the overall rating this year for Greater Victoria, uh, covering all issues, is a B plus, which means there's a little bit of room for improvement. But that's a pretty positive rating. How does this really compare, do you think, with the way people perceive things or even in past years, a B plus? Yeah, it's it's an interesting rating this year because uh, the last two years uh, during the pandemic, we've actually gone down to a B after a string of B pluses before that. And so, I mean, from, from my side, it shows some optimism in, uh, in what's happening in our community and in our region. Uh, and it's important to also think about the time when the survey was put out. So the Vital Signs survey goes out in May and June of each year. And I know just from my, my standpoint, at that time, there was a lot of optimism around uh, the summer, around getting back to seeing friends and family, getting back to some normalcy uh, as to what you would see uh, pre-COVID and uh, and some of those exciting things that are part of part of our everyday life. So uh, I think that that's a part of this grade this year and seeing that slight bump up from a B to a B plus. Now, one of the interesting dynamics within the report is we do grade issue areas as well. Uh, and within that, we actually only had one of the 12 issue areas increase in grade. And so it's very fascinating that uh, that people when asked about the overall quality of life in our community said that it was better. But then when you start getting into the issue areas, you had five grade changes this year out of the 12, and only one of them was an increase. Yeah. So let's talk about the categories that you're that you're referring to here in the survey. I'm one of the people that that is involved in this survey too, but what are the categories? Yeah. Let's remind everybody. So we have 12 issue areas that, uh, that people grade uh, and give an overall grade for, but then also uh, most of the issue areas have additional questions associated with them. And uh, that goes into a, a much larger report on our website. So the 12 issue areas are arts and culture, belonging and engagement, environmental sustainability, economy, getting started, health and wellness, housing, learning, safety, sports and recreation, standard of living, and uh, transportation. So these are all graded uh, from our citizen survey, uh, which goes out in the spring. Yeah, we're going to kind of unpack a little bit of that as we go along here. Housing, of course, huge issue. We'll touch on that a little bit later on. So who are the people that are surveyed? Who's in that matrix of people? So what we do is we work with uh, our partners at Leger, and there's two ways that uh, the surveying is done. One is that there is a panel that uh, is done each year of approximately 400 people. This year, there was 408. And that helps us look at the validity of the numbers that are coming in. And every year, the numbers that we get from our citizen survey, that's the open link, are very close to that panel survey. So that's a very good way for us to test and see what uh, that's looking like. Uh, This year, we had 2,542 people complete the survey. 408 from that panel, and another 2,100 approximately uh, from the open link, which is advertised throughout the communities. So through the chamber newsletter, uh, through adver- other advertising channels, through our uh, e-newsletter and, uh, and other places too. And so it's people that are interested in taking the survey and, uh, and, and being able to uh, provide their input into the, uh, the topic for the year. So there's a wide range of people that, uh, that complete the survey from uh, all over 
the uh, uh, Capital Regional District, which is our geographical area, um, and then also from uh, from different uh, backgrounds and cultures as well. Yeah, we, of course, all through the pandemic saw technology take a huge increase as we seemingly spend half of our life on Zoom like you and I are today or on Microsoft yeah. Teams or something. But without this being either a too complicated or too simple a question, what was the impact of the pandemic on the survey outcomes, do you think, and what criteria were most impacted, both positively and negatively? I think that uh, when you look at the impact of uh, of COVID, I mean, one of the things that we've seen is is increases in the number of people completing our surveys. So, I mean, we had uh, uh, 2,500 approximately this year complete the survey, which I think, as you just alluded to, that is part of looking at uh, uh, how people are are interacting and what they're what they're willing to do and where they're willing to spend their time right now. Um, but I think that when you look at the overall vital signs uh, report and the impacts of the pandemic, uh, you can definitely see threads of it throughout the report. And this year, we actually did end up taking out the um, questions directly related to the pandemic. Uh, we'd asked them the last two years, we wanted to make sure that we were staying relevant. And uh, uh, we also had advice that that was something that uh, people were were actually not interested in taking surveys as much about the pandemic. So we did step away from that this year. But I mean, one of the interesting stats in the community focus section, for example, in the standard of living is in 2021, there were 131,000 visits to food banks in BC, and that was up 5% from 2019. And a lot of that has to do with pandemic effects, whether it's, um, you know, it's, uh, just on individuals or supply chain or costs of incre increasing. So it's something that's a very fascinating thread that you will find throughout the report is these, uh, uh, as you look through this, especially the secondary data, how the pandemic has impacted uh, these areas and and what that actually means for our community. Yeah, this is a, a really uh, concise snapshot of, of all those those categories that you mentioned as well, the issue areas. Um, one of the things I want to talk about is one that you mentioned, that is, what do you think people said in this survey about health care? We want to talk about that next. Our guest on Chamber Chats today is Jonathan Dick, who is the Director of Communications and Community Engagement for the Victoria Foundation who have recently released their 17th Vital Signs Report into the Greater Victoria Community. So, Jonathan, I'm going to read directly from my notes here. Okay. One of the stats has 64% of respondents citing healthcare as both a concern and an issue. Obviously, the pandemic is a feature, a feature in that, but it speaks to the larger challenges in healthcare right now. What does that number mean to you? So I think that when you look at the most important issues in Greater Victoria, I mean, you you look at it year over year, uh, healthcare has been in that top area, but it was sixth last year, and now it's up to third this year. Um, so I think that when you're you're looking at the statistics and what is important to people, uh, you also have to look at what's happening in our community and what other conversations are happening around your tables, around, uh, you know, in the media, in boardrooms, around kitchen tables. And this is one that's definitely there. Um, the other thing that I encourage people to take a look at is our digital platform, which is our Vital Victoria digital platform, because it tracks uh, data year over year uh, in a number of categories. And so when you look at some secondary data around this, uh, population with red regular medical professionals, you see the lines in 2015, 2016 very tight together. And an interesting piece of this is that you can see uh, South Vancouver Island service delivery area going on a downward trend where you see everywhere else either slightly declining in BC and Canada or staying approximately the same. So it's it's really interesting to tie that in and look at the secondary data and be able to say, what is this trend over time and why is this happening? And I think that there's no doubt that uh, when you look at uh, the stats that, that that is happening. The other thing that we found in the citizen uh, survey is that 58% of respondents said their access to physical health care in a timely manner is below average or poor. And 54% of respondents said uh, the uh, same thing about mental health access. So I think that it is really telling about what's happening uh, in our region around this issue. Yeah, I'll, I'll say again something we've said quite often in these chamber chats, and that is it, it would appear, and it's almost very obvious, that the mental health impact of the pandemic is greater than the economic impact of the pandemic. We've seen that. So uh, obviously this kind of, this reflects the stress on healthcare workers and the demands on the healthcare system. Is that right? 
Uh, we don't necessarily have direct data about that within our report, but I think that what you can see is, I mean, for example, one of the community focus sections talks about uh, data from MetaMap, which does have a couple caveats on it. It isn't in every province that they have this data available. But one of the interesting pieces in our health and uh, wellness section is according to MediMap, we have the longest wait times for walking clinics in Canada at 161 minutes. BC was at 58 minutes and uh, Canada overall was at 25 minutes according to Medi MediMap. So I think that this is a really interesting piece and it does talk about the uh, stressors that, that are on the systems right now and why people may be feeling the way that they are. The other interesting piece in that data is that uh, uh, there was a feeling that in-person visits would drop because of online access to medical professionals and that increased during the pandemic. BC, that, that was true everywhere besides BC where uh, uh, wait times increased by 35%. So I think that's an interesting uh, in, uh, piece of information in this report that can give a, a bit of an insight into what is going on within our systems. I think some people also have been a little bit reluctant to embrace the idea of telehealth, where they can call a line and speak with a medical practitioner that way. It's something that actually chamber members can access through a program that we have. Companies like TELUS offer it as well. So maybe there's been some reluctance to, to access that too. Um, something else that has sort of, again, reared its ugly head throughout the pandemic, and I will refer this in terms of mental health and housing, but the outcome has been crime and violence that gets a lot more attention these days. Crime and violence rooted in the fact that we have a larger mental health and housing crisis. But I'm going to quote a stat here once again. The regional crime rate, which is crimes per 100,000 people here, is below yeah. the BC rate, which is 8,300 per 100,000. But we are above the national crime rate of 5,900 per 100,000 people. Um, have, has there been a, a pandemic connection made there? Uh, I can't speak directly about the pandemic connection, but what I can speak to is that this is consistent with 2021 and 2020 vital signs reports of us being in this sort of middle zone between BC and Canada. Um, one of the interesting pieces going from uh, and the overall crime rate from 2011 is that technically uh, the overall crime rate in the Victoria uh, census metropolitan area is down 17 percent uh, in that time period. And just a reminder that some of these stats have lag on the, have a bit of lag because these are 2021 stats that we're talking about uh, this in this year's report uh, based on when the data is available. Uh, so I think that it is um, it is an interesting stat to keep tracking, and it's something that is also available on our digital platform that people can see that trend over time and how we have stayed in the middle of those those pieces. Now, it is a it is an interesting piece about how you you look at uh, other pieces of data within the report and uh, and start looking at uh, at those those crimes and what's reported. And so I would encourage people to really take a look at the uh, drill down on some of those other pieces of data that are in the report. Yeah, mental health has certainly been front and center, both through the, the crime and violence, things that are reported that we see through media and things like that. But 40% of respondents to this vital signs survey um, mentioned mental health, homelessness, and addictions. So that was mentioned by 40% of people, because I think more are now realizing the connection between mental health addictions and, and homelessness. Is that fair to say? I, I would agree. I think that when you look at those top six issues uh, within the, the most important issues in Greater Victoria, and so that's cost of living and housing tied for number one at 68%, and then you have healthcare, homelessness, addictions, and mental illness, it's really hard to solve one of those problems without solving others. Um, and there is a definite connection between all, all of these issues. Um, and I think that we're seeing more recognition of that, especially around, as you mentioned earlier, around mental illness in our communities and uh, the impact that that has on people. Because these are, you know, I, I, I always like to remind people that when we're talking about these statistics and we're talking about these numbers and percentages, there's a person behind each one of these. And there's somebody that's responding to this and saying, this is the way that I see things and this is what's important to me. And so it is a, a challenge and it's something that as a community, it's not a, it's not a one organization or one person fix. This is a, these, these are things that we need to come together as a community and solve together. When we did the, uh, the launch event in the room, as I mentioned with uh, former Mayor Ellen Lowe and uh, the SIP CEO, Emily DeRosenroll, 
one of the things that was most surprising for a lot of people was speaking in terms of, I spoke with Alan about the years when he was the mayor, which was yes. 15 years ago, the astounding increase in housing costs. Because in this vital signs report in the early years of the 17, housing wouldn't have been near the top of the, of the list. I mean, it was, it's always been expensive here, but it wouldn't have certainly been to the degree it is now, would it? No, and then when you go back to 2013, I mean, the top uh, top three were cost of living, mental illness, followed by housing. But you you looked at the percentages, and it was very different. Cost of living was was higher, and uh, there. I mean, I, I think that one of the fascinating things about this report is that we do have our first failing grade ever, and that is in housing. And I think that whenever we get a failing grade in something, it's it's a challenge. It's a challenge for the community. It's a, nobody ever likes that. I think that we all remember getting that report card and wanting to see what your grades are and go for and and see how you're doing. And you always dreaded potentially getting a, a failing grade on something. And none of us like that, and none of us want to be there. Um, and so it is something that you know over the years this has been a growing trend. And uh, again, on our digital platform, we do have. Uh, rental rates and housing costs that you can see this trend line going up over the last two decades. Uh, and so I, I don't think that it's a surprise where we are now or a surprise at what grade 51% of our residents gave to housing, uh, especially given that now, uh, you know, in the report, we take the May uh, real estate board numbers that the cost of a single family home was $1.25 million. Uh, and you look at rental rates right now, you hear about that a lot in the news as well, about uh, people struggling to find rental accommodation. And so I think this isn't a, it isn't a surprise as to where we are, but I think that it is something that we can come together as a community and solve. Yeah. A little bit past that time in May, the housing prices did peak. And then since then, the measures have been introduced to increase interest rates and, and slow some of that stuff down. I don't think house prices are going to go down. They're going to even out and they won't continue to mm -hmm. increase the way they were before. But but yeah, when you get that failing grade, all of you at the Victoria Foundation were looking at this data and you probably looked at each other and said, we've actually got a failing grade. It doesn't reflect on you, but the community gave that a failing grade. That's a bit of an eye-opener, isn't it? it? It definitely is an eye-opener. Um, and especially because, as I said, this is the first time that we have had a failing grade uh, in, in the Vital Signs Report. And um, I mean, we have a lot of great things about our community. There's a lot of great pieces in the report and there's a lot of things that we do really well. But I think that this is a one of those ones that is a wake up call for us. And I know that just over the uh, few weeks that the report has been out, that it is a topic of conversation. Uh, but it is something that it hasn't been a piece that people have said, wait a minute, this this doesn't line up, because I think that it is the feeling in the community when you look at the media, when you look at other reports that are coming out and you look at the other citizen survey data. So. For example, 70% of respondents said the availability of affordable home ownership options to meet their needs is below average or poor. So other question, 84% of respondents said the availability of affordable rental accommodation to meet their needs is below average or poor. Uh, so this, is a, this isn't just a small percentage of people saying that there's change needed. This is, this is our community saying something's there. And I mean, the other thing that we did was we we also looked internally as to what are we doing. And so you'll see on the housing section uh, of the Vital Signs Report a story about the Ukrainian village. So the Victoria Foundation is supporting uh, Ukrainian immigrants coming to our community with affordable housing through the Qantas uh, Village Society, the Ukrainian Cultural Society, and the Ukrainian Cultural uh, Church of St. Nicholas. So uh, with those, we funded the lease and additional cost to provide housing for 30 to 40 immigrant uh, families for the next year. In impact investing, we are invested in the Van City Affordable Housing Project um, through the Van City Affordable Housing Accelerator Fund's goal to uh, in, uh, enhance housing security and increase the availability of adequate, affordable, and climate-ready housing. Uh, and you can find more about that on our Pulse blog from our website. And then we're also engaging in a vital conversation which is about uh, envisioning an affordable community for all. And so we did have our first session around that uh, as part of Rising Economies Week with the South Island Prosperity Partnership. Uh, and there, you can see that online as well if you wish to. And we will have more conversations in the new year, both online and, uh, and in person around this topic, uh, because I think that this is something that um, as a foundation, and as I've said before, 
it's not going to be one group that fixes this. This is a community piece that has to come together. And you do see a lot of conversations and a lot of different things happening at various levels of government and various parts of the community. But something that we all have to come together and do our part and think about what can we do to try to help this situation. Yeah. Okay, Jonathan, I want to touch on something a little more positive next. Our guest on Chamber Chats today is Jonathan Dick. He is the Director of Communications and Community Engagement uh, for the Victoria Foundation. So, Jonathan, 69% of respondents in the Vital Signs Survey said our natural environment was the best thing about living here. So that's our climate, um, our parks, our air quality, the walkability, the cycleability, all of those things. It says a lot about our lifestyle and our appreciation for it, doesn't it? I, I think that's 100% on the mark, Bruce. I think that when you look at the best things about living in Greater Victoria, uh, a lot of it does serve, and people have said that in the report, is it is our natural environment. It's our our general weather, and that's what uh, that word climate means in, in that sense. Uh, parks is another key one. I have two small children, and I can tell you our region has wonderful parks to be able to go and enjoy with small small kids. And, uh, you know, you hear it all the time from people with pets about uh, the, the great uh, spaces available to them as well and areas to be able to go walk, whether it's down by the breakwater or on Dallas Road or uh, East Soup Park, wherever that might be that you want to go in the region. Uh, there's places all around you that uh, that make this this part of the world great. And I think that's also why you're seeing so many people wanting to live and work in Greater Victoria. Uh, despite some of the, the challenges that are here, I think that these benefits really do prop up our region and make it a world-class area. So what are the action items out of this? Just to wrap this up, Jonathan, what is it we can be doing to make changes in those stats that are that are embedded within the Vital Signs Report to make this a better place to live? What sort of steps can we all be taking? I think that there are a few things that we can do, and one of them is appreciate what those uh, things that are working are within our region. We did have two B pluses this year in learning and sports and recreation. Uh, and then the other uh, best things about uh, living and working in Greater Victoria, as you uh, as you mentioned. Uh, so I think that being able to preserve those and enhance those are a key piece, but also taking a look at the most important issues and thinking about your sphere of influence and your sphere of what you're doing and being able to say, this is what I think that I can I can impact. I know at the foundation, we really take this report seriously. It's something that we're very committed to as we've done over the last 17 years. And it's influenced our, it influences our board, our staff, what are you doing in strategic initiatives and granting and in our work with our donors as well. So it's a really key piece of work. And uh, I do encourage people to join our vital conversations as they come. Well, we can all do more to make this remarkable place where we live even better. Take a look at the Vital Signs Report online at the Victoria Foundation website. There's a link on the Chamber website as well. Jonathan Dick, the Director of Communications and Community Engagement for the Victoria Foundation, thanks for being here today. Thanks so much for having me, Bruce. And I'm Bruce Williams. We'll see you again for another Chamber Chats.